There we go. Right, right, shall we kick off? Um, we've got a good number in. Right, so hello and welcome everyone. I'm Rebecca Harding and I'm Chairman of the Society of Women Writers and Journalists. It's great to have you all here with us today and I'm delighted to introduce Katie Childs. Now she's Chief Executive of Chawton House which is the historic estate of Edward Austin Knight, who was Jane Austen's brother. And I'm not going to steal any of Katie's thunder as she's going to tell us all about it, so I'm not even going to try. But if you have any questions you want to ask, then please use the Q&A box, not the chat box, at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. So that's the Q&A box. So Katie, how are you doing? Hello. Well, it's so nice to, to see you and to, to be able to talk to, to the society. Um, and just to explain, um, I, I don't live in a very dramatic house. I'm at Chorton House um, and I'm in our Great Hall. So um, I thought I would, uh, I thought I'd come in and do the talk um, from, from the house. So you get a, a little glimpse um, of, of what it's like. Yeah, and I wasn't... So I was impressed by your fireplace there. <laughs> yeah, it's a historic fireplace in the Great Hall. Um, and uh, yeah, so it gives you a sense of the sort of the age of the building. Yeah, that's great. So you're going to tell us about um, the house and about Jane's time there and also about the library and the books. So I, I, I'm going to leave it to you and I'll just chip in with questions <laughs> as they come please up. Do. Um, please do, because I could talk about the house um, <laughs> It's, um, it's got the most wonderful set of stories. Um, so for, for those of you who, who are not familiar with um, Chalkman House and, uh, and where we are, we're in Hampshire, in North East Hampshire, just outside the town of Alton in the village of Chalkman, as the name suggests. Um, and Chalkman House is what we describe as the historic estate and library, um, which, as Becca says, was, was once owned by, by Jane Austen's brother. So I'll tell you a little bit about how this corner of Hampshire happened to be owned by, owned by Jane Austen's brother um, and where the Knights bit comes in um, with Edward Austen Knight. Um, and we do have um, this extraordinary library um, of early women writers um, and I'll explain how, how all this fits in. Yeah. Um, but we are in Elizabethan Manor House, we're setting 200 acres of parkland, farmland and parkland, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and we are, are a, a Quite, it's, it's, not a, it's not a huge house, this, although we, we call this the Great Hall, um, that you, you may have been in larger ones. So it's like a country house, as opposed to a big sort of Palladian mansion. Yes, um, it's very I, beautiful, having been. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, stunning. Um, <laughs> yes, and there are some really, um, we've, we've been filling our, uh, our Instagram feed up with really beautiful pictures um, of the house and the grounds. Um, so the house has been in the Knight family since around about the 16th century. Um, and it still is, the freehold still is in the Knight family. Um, and so it's the, they've had an unbroken succession um, through nearly 500 years, um, which is extraordinary and is really, really rare for a, for a country mm -hmm. like this. Um, and we operate Chawton House as a, as a charity. We're, we're uh, an independent charity um, and we have our own collection in the house and the Knight family have some of their collection uh, in the house, some of which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, but one of the reasons they could keep the property um, within the family for such a long time is that um, they would pass property not just from through the male line, but they passed through the female line. They had a preference that daughters would inherit before um, cousins and nephews, male cousins and nephews. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the ways in which in which there were there were more people to keep the line alive. Um, the other way is that anybody who married into the family and became uh, and, began, and owned this property had to change their name to Knight. So you have men changing their name um, on marriage or on, on inheriting this. So um, probably our favourite name uh, was Bulstrode Peachy, already a brilliant name, but he, he became Bulstrode Peachy Knight on marrying um, Elizabeth Knight. And I wanted to mention Elizabeth. Um, one of the ways I've been trying to work out, but for those who are who are watching, I was trying to work out where's the best place for me to sit so you could see something of Chawton, um, but we still had decent Wi-Fi because obviously we're rural Hampshire. <laughs> That's not always a given. Um, I really wanted to try and get Elizabeth, our enormous portrait of Elizabeth Knight. So I was just trying to get her uh, and kind of looming behind me in the background because that's sometimes how I feel. Um, Elizabeth um, was has been the only female squire 
of Chawton House. Mm. She ran Chawton House for 35 years and she ran Chawton House in the 17th century. It's the most extraordinary story that she, as a, a, in the late 17th century, she, an early 18th century, she as a female landowner um, was rare enough anyway. It's probably only about 10% of land was controlled by women, um, but she absolutely ran the estate. Um, so she managed um, the steward, she managed her legal affairs, she wrote her own marriage contract to Bulstrode Peach. Good girl. <laughs> Um, and I'll men I mention Elizabeth because of a little bit as how we, uh, in terms of yeah. how, she, how her influence um, comes to, to Jane Austen. Well, Elizabeth's important for the history of Chawton House because um, she didn't have children. Um, she had two husbands and no children. And she, um, so she hadn't spent 35 years running this estate and others. And um, she, she owned West Dean um, mm. with one of another one of her estates she hadn't spent her life um being this extraordinary woman um to see the next male line uh, in line fritter away um her lifetime's work so she selected her heir um, and that That's paves sensible. the way for, exactly um paves the way for how edward inherits this estate um so thomas and catherine um about uh, 70 80 100 years on from from elizabeth um thomas knights um Thomas May Brodnax Knight, he inherited a few estates, had to change his yeah. name, um, and he marries Catherine and they head off on their honeymoon and on a tour of their lands, uh, as you do. Um, well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm always so, touring my land, always. <laughs> this was, that would be a tour of the balcony at the back of our house or the back garden, um, but for them, quite, quite a part of Hampshire, uh, Kent and Hampshire. And uh, whilst one of the places where uh, they had they owned uh, land and they had the gift of uh, who was appointed as the as the vicar was the rectory um, and the parish of Steventon, um, and they'd appointed one of uh, one of their cousins, uh, George Austin, um, a very upstanding, well-educated man, an Oxford graduate, um, who would who was the vicar. Um, at uh, Stevenson and they stayed with him and there they met um, their, the, the, their children including 12 year old Edward who they absolutely fell in love with um, and they took him with them on the rest of their honeymoon nice. and, I know. and then uh, they started to develop this relationship with the with the family where he would um, he was appointed effectively kind of adopted and it was all all the correspondences uh, that you can read about about this is it's all very well um considered i think yeah. george Austin's, reverend austin's uh main worries was interrupting edward's schooling and i think his wife sort of points out that the resources available to thomas and catherine i uh, mean so i don't think they need to worry about his schooling so they sent him on the grand tour to sort of learn how to be a country gentleman um and in as he when thomas dies he inherits um, not just this estate but godmission park which is actually ultimately becomes the family home um, and after two years, uh, Catherine, who'd uh, inherited um, from her husband, again, that's, that's quite forward thinking of the Knight family, that they look after the, the, the widowed women. Um, but she's, she's fed up of sort of knocking around Godmission Park. It's absolutely enormous, is Godmission Park. I think it's the, the influence uh, on, for Pemberley, of the inspiration, I should say, for Pemberley. Yeah. So she, ra she rattles around, she says, it's too, too big for me. Edward, you've got a growing family. By this point, he's married Elizabeth Bridges from a good Kentish family um, at the a nearby estate of Goodenstone. And she, um, so she vacates to a, to a house in Canterbury and she gives um, Edward Chawton and Godmersham. And Edward and his wife, Elizabeth, and they have 11 children. Um, Elizabeth oh. died in childbirth, oh. 11, which is... 11. Makes me As cringe. <laughs> I, mean, I know. I, there's, there's no, but she was 35 when she died. And there's, I don't, it doesn't matter oh. money and how much land and how extraordinary lucky Edward and Elizabeth were to inherit these two estates. I don't think any of us would wish to swap places with Elizabeth. <laughs> um, Edward lived until he was in his 80s, so he was 85. So he lived a long time without, without Elizabeth um, and didn't remarry. So he must, even though he must have been in his, in his late 30s, very eligible bachelor, but he never remarried. Um, he's by all accounts quite quiet, um, the, the sort of the quiet sibling of the Austins. Um, so Jane Austen, um, he, when he, he uh, for the first, for first few years whilst he had inherited Chawton, it was tenanted. And when that tenancy uh, came to an end, he decided he wouldn't re-let it, 
but would start to use this as a, as a summer property, um, especially when they were refurbishing Grobnesham Park. Um, and they would use it. It was a very convenient location. We're not we're not terrific distance yeah. outside of London, even with travelling distance, so sort of travelling times in the early nineteenth century. And we're very close to Winchester, in between Winchester and uh, Southampton. And if you think of where the Austin um, families were located, they were a Hampshire family, um, but with the Kent influence of the Knights. So um, they kept uh, Chawton. And he made, when his father had died a few, a few years previous, and, and it was the case with women in those days, um, that the responsibility for the unmarried women and some of the um, widows um, fell to um, the male uh, members of the family. Um, and the eldest brother, Frank, had, had initially sort of sought to, to look after, and two, two of the other brothers had looked, including Edward, to look after um, the Cassandra, Jane, and their mother. Um, but it was Edward who provided them with their longer term home by providing them a cottage on the estate here at Chawton. And that cottage is now obviously Jane Austen's house, but it was the yeah. bailiff's cottage. Um, so it's one of the biggest houses in the village. Um, so it's the bailiff's cottage on the crossroads. Um, what you see with their correspondence, their letters, not just Jane's letters, but all the other family letters as well, um, and, and kind of diary, uh, journal and uh, records of, of, of things that, that many of the Knight family and the Austin family wrote is that there was a huge, that the, the, the Austins down at Chorton Cottage would spend an enormous amount of time here. So they'd walk the grounds, um, they'd dine here, they'd uh, come for family evenings, um, and they would, the landscape was something they were enormously familiar with. And actually some of the, the, the views that we have from the house and up to the house um, from, from Church Meadow, yeah. they're the unspoiled kind of 19th century views. Right. So it's just beautiful. I remember walking up there, it was absolutely yeah, stunning. Well, it's just, yeah. Right. Um, and what was what was displayed in the house um, as well was what was on the walls, including the enormous portrait of Elizabeth Knight. Um, that, you know, that all all three of the Austin women were, were enormously familiar with it. And if you start to then kind of begin to know the story, and that's the story mm. we tell at Chawton to visitors. Um, you start to see some of the, um, the echoes through all the novels. So you see the landscape in Mansfield Park. You see um, Elizabeth Knight, in my view, in uh, Lady Denham in Sanderton. You see um, the echoes of, well, Knight and Knightley. I mean, that's not a terrific yeah. <laughs> imagination for a start. Um, and so that's what we do at Chawton, is, um, is that we are kind of uniquely positioned to be able to show what, you know, kind of what she lived around and, and those yeah. influences on her. And then you mentioned the library. We actually have two library collections here at Chawton House. Um, so we have a collection, the collection from Godmersham Park, so the Godmersham Park Library that Edward owned, um, was an extraordinary library collection, particularly for the time. It, 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 extraordinary because it was so big and so varied, um, but included so many works by women um, and novels, which was almost scandalous at the time. And uh, then it, it's, it's, there's a sort of 500 book nucleus, if you like, that remained in the Knight family and miraculously survived several years in sort of outbuildings and sheds and things like that. Um, but we have uh, Edwards, for some reason, made a very, very detailed catalogue of what was in Godmersham Park Library, both by where it was located and, um, and where uh, and what books were by, uh, are listed by author. Um, and so we, and he also had extremely distinctive book plates. So um, we are able to trace and track, well, as, as we do a lot of stuff these days, but we're able to track <laughs> those books um, are. Yeah. So at auction, the book plates are so distinctive. Um, but you look through what was in that library and you look through the works that were mentioned um, and are, in, uh, uh, are mentioned in Jane Austen's works. Um, so little things like uh, Walter Elliot's only reads um the, the book of peer the peerage book and yeah. uh, we have that copy and it's the bridges family copy um and that was in the library so she's selecting what's the only book he's going to be and she's she writes about how she sits in godmersham park library being mistress of all she surveys she spends months and months and months at godmersham because as i mentioned elizabeth died in childbirth there were 11 yeah. fullest children to look after and two maiden aunts would spend time uh, one at Gomish and one at Chawton with their mother and then swap. So it's, you see the dynamics of kind of family life. And again, that all starts to play through Jane's. 
Lovely. Do you think the the children that she was obviously surrounded by gave her the inspiration for things like the the Bennett family in um, Pride and Prejudice? Um, Do you think she got any of that from there? I think so because they were terrific. They, 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 both the Austin and the Knight families are huge families. Um, and so, and she would spend a lot of time with her nieces and nephews. So not just the Knight children, but if you think uh, Anna uh, Austin, so, uh, who became Anna Lefroy, and um, she, so the do eldest daughter of her eldest brother, um, her mother died when she was, I think, two years old. Um, and she, Anna moved into the rectory at Stevens. Right. Um, and so she's, and as the eldest of the nieces and nephews, spent a lot of time with both Jane and Cassandra. Um, and then you have these 11 night children. Um, so some who, uh, who would have remembered Jane Austen because obviously Jane dies when she's 41. But so Fanny, for example, mm -hmm. the oldest, um, has a very uh, kind of uh, detailed, kind of in-depth relationship with her aunts. Um, but it's even when you get down to the middle siblings, the May, Lou and Cass, um, the three sisters in the middle, who do recall, particularly May, do recall their aunt and do recall them sitting around um, while she read uh, ch early chapters of novels to the older um, night children, um, but the, the younger ones were deemed too young, and May's right in the middle. Um, so sometimes she's allowed in, and sometimes she's not. So yeah, oh. I, you, you, uh, one of the pieces of work we're doing at the moment um, with one of our volunteers is we're trying to unpick the whole night family and and, mm. and history, and also the history of this house because there's so many. There's you, you could put queries and questions about what we about about why things are where they are. So yeah, we. Um, we start. You start to find even more influences, and so the Elizabeth um, Knight story that I told you is quite a new one. That's new scholarship, um, but presumably you don't walk the portrait on our stairs and, and not be curious um, with a mind like Jane Austen's as to what's yeah. the story behind, behind that woman. Um, that you mentioned the second library, so we have a, a huge collection of early women writers. Um, so we've got around uh, ten to 12,000 works by women who were either contemporaries of Jane Austen or who were influenced by her or she was influenced by. Um, so you, it's not the sort of thing you expect to find up a long drive in rural Hampshire. But um, yes, and I, I've got actually just by my side, so I'm just going to show you a couple of props. Um, so what you this is what you prepared earlier, was it? Yeah. <laughs> the old blue pieces of it. So I'm really hoping, so I was also in the stores, I was like, well, it's got to be something you'd be able to see over Zoom. So I'm going to just uh, lean in a little. So I hope that's uh, okay. Yeah. So this is Mysteries of Adolfo. And if you um, know your Northanger Abbey, um, oh, yes. Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Adolfo. So this is volumes two and three of a four volume first edition that we a have. Oh, and they're beautiful covers as well, so the first edition. Volumes one and four, because they are in poor state of repair. So I don't know what that says if people miss the middle two. <laughs> <laughs> but we, yeah, the first editions that we do have are, and we have obviously first editions of Austin's work, we have some manuscripts in Jane Austen's hand, a manuscript in Jane Austen's hand. Um, and then we have books that are, um, that are just curiosities. And I just, I thought for the Society of Women Writers and Journalists, this is, um, you might appreciate, I know nothing about this other than the fact it's by a lady called Mary Howitt. Um, and I just saw it on the, uh, on the shelf as I was walking past. Um, and it's called No Sense Like Common Sense. Absolutely. <laughs> It is a novel, um, but presumably it's 1842. It might be quite a, a moralistic novel, I would presume. You think? <laughs> and just so you know a little bit about, I've talked about the book plates from Robinson Park. Um, yeah. Ed, uh, Austin Knight's uh, grandson, Montague, inherits this property uh, in the late 19th century. He's extraordinarily proud of being Jane Austen's great nephew, because by that point, that's when Jane's um, fame starts to rise. Um, he recatalogues um, the book collection. Um, he is a, is a curator, um, really. Um, so when we, we had a huge re-presentation of the house over the winter, which is what we were going to show to the public uh, in 2020. Um, and when we took the portraits down, um, he's written notes and, and wax sealed them with his um, insignia on the back, um, which was enormously helpful um, for us. Um, but he, and he's responsible, if you see behind me, 
there's heraldry behind me. So that shows his kind of pride in the family. And the heraldry runs all the way around this room um, and shows the sort of the different families that have married into, um, into the Knight family. But he's, um, this is a very distinctive book plate that Monty oh, has. That's beautiful. Um, so he actually has three book plates, um, but this is the most frequent one. And yeah. he um, commissions in 1901, 1902, he commissions sort of London's premier book plate mm engraver and um, to do the Montague Knight book plates and um, so those are so distinctive which is which is how when they come to auction that we know they and we can check them with the catalogues both Monty's catalog you can find them you can find them and we have a little group of people called the gloss the Gomersham lost uh Gomersham Park lost sheep society um, and they return them and this is the last one they returned I went to pick it up um, just after sure. lockdown and it, it, just to show you the breadth of Edward's um, studies, it's all in Latin, so I've got a clue what most of it says. Um, <laughs> sorry, my Latin was they, dreadful. No, they no. made me do Latin at school. I'm still in therapy. <laughs> Not much Latin was taught in Bolton in the 1980s. Um, it is a, um, from, uh, it's basically a, a medicine journal from the Royal Society of Surgeons in Edinburgh. Um, so we don't know why it was in Edward's collection, but it's all sorts of, um, it's probably very good for these times, um, but it's ways of making kind of tinctures and uh, uh, all sorts of syrups and things like that to, to cure people and cure your illness. Bit of bleaching. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the Latin is for leaching, but I'm not sure I'm going to find out. Um, so, and so they're still coming back and we, we have, you it's know, cool. they Option and providing them yeah. really expensive, um, which some of them, one or two, have been. In that case, we find out who, who bought them, we we'll take a picture of it. But um, yeah, we there's those, and those are coming back to Chawton House, um, those, those collections. That's great. So just going back to Jade, so she became famous in her lifetime. Um, so there's people listening that don't know much about how she got published. And obviously, it was difficult for women to get published then. Well, how did she go about getting published at that time? And she just wasn't published in her own name, she only, she only ever wrote as a lady. Um, so it was only after she died um, that the last two of her novels to be published together, Northanger Abbey and Persuasion, um, it was her, bro her brother Henry um, who decided that they would be published and he writes um, that they are published by the authors of, she, she, she tended to say she's the author of Pride and Prejudice, um, so that they, um, that they are published by the author of Pride and Prejudice, which was my sister Jane Austen. And so he provides the first biographical details. It must have been quite well known that she, that a lady, to some people um, within literary circles, that a lady was Jane Austen, uh, Jane Austen, because of course she's invited to um, up to, to London to meet the Prince Regent, you know, the, at the invitation of the Prince mm. Regent to see the library, um, and she, she donates a copy. Um, of her work and dedicates a copy of one of her works to um, to the Prince Regent. So she wasn't she wasn't as some of the writers are in this collection completely anonymous, um, and, and some of our writers we still don't really know who they are. Um, but she, so she was she she was well known, but she was she wouldn't publish in in her own name, and that's possibly because it's there was just not a, a, a kind of a tradition of it. In fact, her name only appears in print once in her lifetime. And when she was at St still living at Steventon, she uh, contributes as a subscriber um, to Frances Burney's novel. Um, and so right. in the front page, um, page of that, and again, we've got first edition of that, um, you see Jane Austen Steventon. Um, and that's the only time her name appears in print in her lifetime. Oh, it's so sad, really, isn't it? <laughs> She's so amazing. <laughs> Yes. Never got to see her name off in lights anywhere. So, did she inspire anybody else um, in the family to write? Did, did oh, anyone yes. else? Yes. Um, so they, she, she definitely uh, did. Um, that's quite a good, accidentally quite a good cue for one of my other props. Um, so she, um, she really inspired. Obviously, her. Um, I, I mentioned Anna, um, and yeah. Anna Lavery inherited the unfinished um, manuscript for Sanditon. Um, and it's uh, which was only uh, its existence was only made apparent years after her death. And Anna tried because she discussed the plot with her aunt. She um, she attempted to, to kind of finish the novel or to complete the novel. And she gets about uh, she does about as much again. 
um, of Sanderton, but she herself doesn't doesn't finish it. Um, so yeah, she she did, and then certainly subsequent generations. Um, so this the reason I got this um, up, apart from the fact it's actually it's quite good to it's quite good visually um, to see. Um, is the the Watsons by Jane Austen's another one of her unfinished works. Um, and this I found in our reference collection when I was doing the display last year. But this is by Edith Brown, who writes just for the, um, uh, on the front, just in case nobody knew, she's Jane Austen's great grandniece. And um, both Edith and her mother, uh, sorry, her grandmother were writers. Her grandmother actually was quite a well-known writer. She moved to America um, and uh, had uh, her husband was committed to an asylum and so she had to write for her basically write for bread yeah um, to, to america and um, was quite a fame a, a well known um in the time uh, and well received author you can't really find we don't have any of her works um because they were they're really rare and this is her granddaughter but both of them tried to complete the watsons and um, edith um, disagrees with how her grandmother did it um, and so has a go um, here um, to try and uh, to try and complete complete the Watsons. Uh, James, her brother, wrote wrote poetry, and, and one of the family uh, kind of games. Because especially if you think if you're living, especially in lockdown, you're living in a place. Oh. Like, <laughs> if you're living in a place like this. You get what, what are you going to do to entertain yourself in the evening? So they write. They they play games. They play really theatrical games. They write plays um, that they put on, and they play charades. Yeah. So it's not just Jane who does that, um, but it's it's the others as well. And actually, some of the more sort of complicated charades um, are uh, are done by James uh, James her brother as well. So um, and Mrs. Austin, her mother, um, famously writes a song about a Christmas pudding. So <laughs> it, it's clearly a family. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Famously in this house, because we had a choir who sung it over Christmas. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, did to <laughs> oh, I think we need to have that online at some point on your website. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't sing it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you've studied her a lot, and you've, you know, you've you've been in the house. What kind of person do you think Jane actually was? I mean, what what do you feel she was like? And you've seen the manuscript as well, the handwritten manuscript, and I think the writing always tells you quite a lot about someone. It is. I'm not an expert enough in handwriting to, to know, but I'd, I'd love someone to have a look at it and to tell us. I think, um, well, I was got asked for a, for a podcast the other day. I was like, what do you think she would make of this kind of industry that, um, that exists? And I think she would be quite amused by it. She was such a good social commentator. Such a, she's, in a way, she's a brilliant uh, social historian um, because of the way the details she writes. She doesn't really draw detailed um, characters. You don't find a lot about kind of how characters look um, but you do find out great details about kind of landscape and um, ceremony and and uh, social kind of conditions at the time social uh, what was socially acceptable um, I talked to a tea historian last year who says well actually her descriptions of how you take tea in the afternoon is really historically valuable and important and um, because oh, you don't get interesting yeah so I get a sense of somebody who is um, very, very smart, obviously, mm -hmm. but very kind of, uh, kind of socially very well aware, um, who reads people quite well, um, and who is unendingly curious. Um, and I think seeing some of the, you know, going to God Mission Park and seeing, you know, the geography of this is, uh, to me, looks like Pemberley. Um, to see, uh, as I said, some of the portraits here, and you see some of the, um, the family it echoes um, through there. She's clearly, she was always watching, she was always picking things up. She's probably a very good, if she was, you know, 250 years on, she might have been a very good observational comedian um, or observational writer. Um, like sort of yeah. Alan Bennett of her day, I don't know, um, where she, um, because that's what she writes brilliantly about. And I think that's why, the story at Chawton House is particularly uh, interesting in the things that we can do is because we show all these influences and we have all these influences with the library but with the landscape and the house and the family as well you get a sense of what it was like for her to write but what it was like for women uh, like her and women in general to write um, in the 17th 18th 19th century. No, it's really interesting. Now, I was also interested because you have your literary festival that you had quite recently. And Caroline Knight, who, who is her, 
great 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 niece great, great yeah great something niece. yeah but she <laughs> she looked really like the painting i got the painting up of jane austen and then looked at a picture of caroline have you done that it's amazing the <laughs> likeness I'm delighted by that. Yeah, um, I was really, I was looking at the pink painting and then thinking, wow, it's, it was really surprising. Um, so, so yeah, so Caroline um, is lived in, and the house was lived in until 1989. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons we have this collection of early women writers is, is the sort of the, the, the I mean, Charlotte House has so many stories, mm. but the chapter sort of 1989 to, to 2017 is, uh, the last squire, another Edward. The knights are terrifically unimaginative when it comes to names, so that's why <laughs> Elizabeths, Edwards, and Richards. Um, I mean, where I'm stood, there are three three Richard uh, knight portraits, um, <laughs> three different three different Richards, and our current squire freeholder is Richard as well. Um, so, uh, and the house uh, Edward. Uh, I mean, country houses in, in, in England after the yeah. Second World War. There's, there's a fairly familiar story there about uh, just how difficult they were to, mm. to manage. And, and I think Edward felt that cleanly, ke uh, keenly. And, um, but the house was in a state of serious disrepair. It was on the red list, um, English Heritage red list, um, seriously at risk. And um, Richard obviously wanted to, he wanted to, um, to save the property and to, to, for it to be a public, mm. um, a public building rather than a family home it was just it, it wasn't really habitable um, for the long term um, and he eventually after a few missteps um, with a hotel company and a golf course and that mercifully the crash in the 80s made sure that that late early 90s made sure that didn't happen um, but he met a lady called Sandy Lerner and she um, was had, had made her money in the tech boom in the 80s and early 90s and she uh, she was a collector of early women writing and she uh, had started to amass the collection that is now here and over the next kind of 20 years she renovated the building um, and she as she had the, the leasehold created this charity that I'm the chief executive of um, donated this extraordinary collection of, of, of books um, and encourage the donations um, of others for a secondary collection as well. And she uh, and it was an academic library for um, for a, you know successfully for that period of time. Um, but it was very very reliant on the generosity of, of uh, the Bossac Kruger Foundation, Sir Sandy and Len. And uh, when understandably after all that time and all that money, their um, their philanthropic interests moved elsewhere um, to other other things. And, you you get one lifetime to be to be that generous and she that the that we've had another sort of reincarnation of the house um and that's now where we're open to the public and we're much more um, kind of publicly public focused it's it's where the academic part is still the core but we tell the that we've got this extraordinary story to tell and so we open to the public we as you said the the, the literary festival and um, it was one way in which and including particularly through the lockdown that we've still kept bringing these stories but caroline's story is a lovely way of uniting that because her she can she can talk about what the house was like in the in the 70s and the 80s and to live here um and that and her her particular influence and being influenced by Jane Austen um, and that just brings it just ties everything nicely together um, because Caroline and you know her brother and her parents they, they're still they still spend a lot of time at the house and that's yeah. that's complete delight for us yeah no that is lovely to still have that link with living relatives it's great so I'm just going to look at some questions now some um, um so if you've got a question to ask then please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and, and we'll ask them so um Pamela Payne says I've got some very old and interesting books if I was to bring them to Chawton could you tell me if they were important and valuable um, we certainly can tell you a bit more about them. Best thing to do is take some photographs of them, though. Um, so particularly photograph um, that if there's anything on the uh, by way of kind of book plates. So here um, and the frontispiece. Um, so these bits. 
um, there. So photograph those um, and any, any details from the covers and anything that you know about them already, um, if you know anything about them at all. Um, and if you send those to info at chortonhouse.org, um, then they can go to our curator and she'll, um, she'll do a bit of um, a little bit of detective work first um, and then if she needs to look at them in person that's a really good idea to bring them down when we're the host is properly open to the public. Yeah, that's great now Fleur's asked um, what's your favourite book in the library? What's your oh, favourite? It's like picking your favourite child it's <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, I have so many I've got so many because I keep I'm, I'm, I've been here for eighteen months so I still I still keep discovering things. Um, I've it's all ready to go but I've curated our next display that will be in our library, um, and that's all about women uh, who were it's all about plants women so women who wrote about plants women who were plant illustrators. Um, and uh, early, sci early uh, botanical scientists. Um, so that's allowed me to dive into that bit of the collection. And, and I discovered this, um, but I've discovered it. It's obviously been here for some time. It was new to me. Um, but this beautiful um, kind of uh, sketchbook of um, uh, flowers by a lady known only as Miss Smith who was probably an art teacher somewhere in, uh, around Doncaster. Um, and she created this beautiful hand-painted folio. There's only about 100 copies of these and uh, very, very few have survived. We've got one, the University Library, uh, University Library in Cambridge have one. Um, and they are plates of hand-painted um, uh, flowers, kind of common English flowers at the time. And then the, the pen drawing so you could learn how to paint, paint them. And it was just, and the fact that no one knows about it, but it's important because it was one of those hundred was um, sold to the royal family. And uh, so it's dedicated um, to the royal family at the front. And it's nice. my favourite. It's the last thing that I looked at and went, I didn't know we had that. Um, but every book tells a story and not just the story inside. So this is the least, my last of my props, this is the least... Um, this is the most 1970s, uh, least uh, kind of <laughs> anticipating book. I, look, I pulled it off the shelf. It's from um, a collection um, that we are just transferring the whole of the collection from a lady called Deirdre Le Fay, um, who's given us her entire library, and it's a research library. Wow. Um, 4,000 books. And this was the first, the first set of books that she'd given. And I pulled it off the shelf. It's a, Sanditon, it's a continuation of Sanditon. Um, a novel by Jane Austen and another lady. And I pulled it down, looked at the artwork and went, well, that's going to be Barbara Cartland or something like that, isn't it? It's, not, <laughs> it's an absolutely amazing story to find out who another lady is. Um, and she, we're going to put all the, the details online, but she, the woman who wrote it was um, married to a, a civil servant in Moscow in the 1960s. Um, and she was a basically a diplomat's wife, but she'd worked in the war. She worked um, for Ian Fleming. Um, really? Super. Yeah, but she could tell stories of spying and the Cold War, and, but she was a Jane Austen fan. And, um, so, and she writes this continuation of Sanditon. It's possibly the best continuation of Sanditon, apart from Anna LaFroy's, um, that there is. So um, even the most unsuspecting, of works in the collection can tell a pretty amazing story. That is really interesting. Now we've got a flood of questions now. Um, so this is where I need my glasses because I'm very old these days. So um, Daniela Norris says, what was the Austin Bronte rivalry all about? How did they even know about each other if everyone published anonymously? And well, of course the Brontes um, published um, initially under pseudonyms and uh, um, uh, androgynous pseudonyms and uh, I, I'm afraid I am not and I am not the person to tell to talk about whether there was a rivalry um, between the between the well not between Jane Austen and them but obviously from Bronte's looking back at their, at their literary influences um, although their their upbringings are similar in a way they're both daughters mm -hmm. of you know, reverence, but for the, the rolling hills of Hampshire and the wilds of uh, of Haworth um, are quite different. I imagine quite different formative experiences. Um, and, I, and I say this as a northerner. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> northerner in Hampshire. <laughs> so yes, um, I, I'm not the, the expert on that, but um, one of our trustees, Karen O'Brien, is an extraordinary scholar of both. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, we're hoping that's going to be one of the uh, talk that she um, that she gives either online or, or at the house and um, which looks at the Brontes and, and Austin but it's interesting you do you do mention the, uh, the Brontes and publishing uh, kind of not anonymously in their case but as, as Acton Ellis and Caravelle and um, our special exhibition which we've moved online because of the obviously for the pandemic but when we reopen the house the exhibition will open as well um, is uh, is all about women who first stepped into into uh, men's world so we include Elizabeth Knight in fact she's the starting point for the story but um, we look at women's uh, women writers who wrote under either pseudonyms or, or male names uh, androgynous names or male names and um, the end of that um, is the Brontes and we've borrowed from the Bronte parsonage um, letters um, in Charlotte Bronte's, uh, from Charlotte Bronte to her publisher, um, where she writes and says, uh, Curabelle has not been well, has not been able to write. Um, you know, I'm not sure when Curabelle will be able to write again, which is basically her making her excuses to her publishers. <laughs> but saying, oh, this Curabelle, this Curabelle is dreadful. Yeah. It sounds, sounds like handing in your homework. Oh, I couldn't do it. <laughs> That's one of three um, amazing, astonishing things we borrowed from from the Bronte Pass. It's the first time they've, they've come this far south, I think, into Hampshire. So um, it's definitely worth worth uh, finding more of the story online and then coming to see us uh, when we reopen. Yeah, no, that sounds brilliant. So um, I've got one from Laura as well. What was the view of the televised drama of Sanderton? Did you like it? Well, I mean, I, well, I thought it was, I'm not a TV critic. I thought it was fine. Um, <laughs> It divided our volunteers and divided um, I know <laughs> dollars. Um, I mean, they did the ending thinking they might get a second series, which I think was a bit yeah. unfortunate. Um, and I think we, I think we all probably could have done with a happy, uh, a happier ending in those circumstances. Um, it was some of my team got to go to the shoot. Actually, oh, I was really on a, fantastic I was on holiday, and I was like, well, there were one perk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then, and, and, I, and we had some wonderful actually to go with this um, Sanderson and what's the uh, display that we did last year with some wonderful set um, photographs that, 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 that they let us have. I think it was beautifully presented, and I think it was great that Sanderson got uh, got some attention because it is such a fast that it was not much of it, but there's so much in it to get into with different characters, different sort of setting being set by, uh, you know, really embracing kind of the industrialization changes to the seaside um, and different sorts of characters. It's, it's a more worldly start to a novel um, than others. So, um, but yes, I do realize uh, it, it divided opinion. Um, <laughs> it, it's taken a little too much dramatic license. And I think, uh, so I thought, I thought it, was, it was an entertaining way to spend Sunday evenings for an hour or so. <laughs> It's a very like, diplomatic response there that will not alienate any group. They could have worked on the music because you can do some wonderful sort of Regency era music. And I think that's the only thing that was there. That, that's, that me could have that's a very good area to go for the music. <laughs> right, we've got another question from Fleur. Do you think Jane would have written in the same way if she didn't live with such a busy household in such an amazing house? How much do you think it influenced her? I think I think the certain that one of the things that frustrates me when when people write about Jane Austen so she was she lived a very sheltered life she you know kind of quiet Hampshire villages and, and things like that. Yeah, uh, the, there would have been a quietness um, to to Chorton, but. Fleur's right. The families were so busy, and they were so big, and there was, um, and they were, you know, they were Frank. Uh, two of the brothers, but Frank uh, was an admiral in the navy. They, these are not these are not parochial no. um, uh, siblings, um, and the siblings all get on very well. Um, and the extended family as well is is, is across the south of England. So I think yeah, it's it's definitely that environment that she she had filters into into her novels and maybe if she lived a a, a more isolated um, existence um, then her life might have might have been different she may have decided to get married for example um, she might have um, she yeah she, she may have written but she may not have had an encouragement to to, to publish and um, which I 
probably came from her brothers and probably came from the fact that her father had, had educated both his daughters as well as his sons. So it's, um, I, yeah, I I, this is one of the reasons why I'm not, sure, I'm not sure you can really understand the works of Jane Austen if you don't really, if you, if, but you can understand, if you, you can understand more of it if you um, understand more of the family context and, and the places which she, which she lived in. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So I've got one another question from Pamela. So, um, she says, are you going to be eligible for any of the money from the government um, that the government is going to distribute to help properties like yours? We don't know. They haven't published any details yet. Um, although the first bit they've said there will be national organisations, which, is, um, which isn't technically technically us. Pamela makes a, a really good point about, and we, you know, we should say something about lockdown. Um, we haven't had any public funding at all. We furloughed some staff, but not, uh, not everybody by any stretch because we wanted to carry on. And we wanted to keep doing sort of digital um, events like this one. You mentioned we did our three-day literary festival. Some of that content is still there for people to explore and get into. We have 31 different talks, um, workshops, interviews, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, they were great. I mean, I've listened to quite a few and they were <laughs> really was, good. Like, there's little of me in it. There's the people who are more interested. <laughs> Um, and we did a garden festival as well, which is kind of similarly. We've run an emergency appeal just because we we haven't had uh, we haven't had that sort of that sort of funding. So yeah, we're ineligible for for the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, we haven't had we're ineligible for the leisure and tourism grant that you get from the local authority. We we haven't had that um, haven't had that either. So. Um, yeah, we will. We, we'll, fingers crossed. Um, hopefully, we meet the criteria when we uh, when uh, it's uh, is published. But um, we will. We're not a pessimist. Is never disappointed. Um, but our focus um, is at the moment is on uh, reopen the phased reopening of the house and making sure that we are reliant on ourselves for for a proportion of our funding. Though we've been absolutely blown over by the generosity of people um, who've kept us going through the four months of lockdown with the through the emergency appeal. So they've they've helped us pay the staff so that we can we can do this. We can we've distributed 400 afternoon tea boxes across um, addresses in, in East Hampshire over the last three months. So it's um, so we kind of do the online version of what we do in the house. And now as we slowly um, the gardens are reopening, we slowly reopen the house that um, we'll be able to bridge that that gap between too. No, that's good. And the gardens, as you say, are open now, so people can book. Um, what's it? Chalton dot Chalton House dot org, isn't it? The yeah. website. Yeah. Paid so. the website. How to how to do that? So we sold out on Sunday. So um, weekends, particularly, if you do want to come, it's definitely a good idea to um, good idea to book because it's, it's a long way to come if you if you can't if you can't get in. Yeah, and it's the coffee shop at the open, oh, the tea shop. Yeah, I've got two two open. Um, just as Today. Um, so we've got inside for ticket holders inside the grounds. If you're familiar with, with Chawton, that's the beautiful old kitchen tea room, which is, as the name suggests, in the old kitchen. And um, and the courtyard outside of there, we've set up for takeaway. Um, and you can go and take a picnic and, and sit on the south lawn. And um, we've moved some of the benches down there as well. So you can either buy food and or bring your own picnic or buy food and drink from, from the tea room and go and, and go and enjoy your take there. Um, and then for people who are not ticket holders, who are not coming to the gardens, but that maybe they're walking the parkland or um, there's, a, there's a long walk between the villages out of, out of Alton. Um, we have the Parkland Pantry, um, which is on our drive so um, and again that does the same sort of hot drinks cold drinks and, and I, I just remember having the biggest piece of sponge cake victoria sponge cake that i have ever had in your coffee shop and it was superb <laughs> i have missed so much about it because i've been working at home for, for quite a while um so it's it's so nice to know be able to come back in the house but i've missed the sausage rolls and the cakes um, which <laughs> probably quite Probably quite good to have had three months off that as a diet. So. No, I, think, I think I'm still trying to remove that sponge cake from my hips. Actually. <laughs> it is fantastic. It is. Oh, they, it, um, oh. And you just the, the Maltese tiffins. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just one other thing I wanted to ask you about was the Jane Austen week where you have dancing and um, tell us all about that because that's that's we, just superb. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, Reg Jane Austen Regency Week, which runs um, across Alton and Jordan. Um, and is, uh, so it's a big collective effort in the area. Um, obviously, it didn't happen this year. We really, really hope we'll be able to do it in mm. June. So it's third, third into the fourth week of June um, every year. Um, and yeah, there's a huge amount of activity that goes on throughout the village but, and, and in the town of Alton as well. Um, so whether it's the, the library doing their, their tours, there's dancing in the assembly rooms, there's a so there's a ball every every Saturday, Saturday first Saturday of Regency Week. We do a Regency picnic here, which Caroline, you mentioned Caroline Knight earlier, Caroline hosted last year. Um, and we do this yeah, calligraphy and embroidery workshops all the way through the week. And then we do a program of talks here. Um, so two or three evenings in the week, we'll do evening talks and, and garden tours during the day. There's so much on. So yeah, it's something that we hope can come back um, next year. And it's part of those, uh, again turning Chawton into Chawton House particularly um, so opening up the doors and opening up the collection to people who want to research and, and to kind of be inspired by it but also finding ways to to open that up to the public through events like a literary festival and like um, Regency Week so we can start to we're at the sort of heart of all of our different communities but we start to tell those stories in all sorts of different ways um, and for different different audiences and, and visitors and can I just make it clear the Regency week is fancy dress isn't it like you do dress in Regency dress the, the, the costume is extraordinary and honestly I, I did do uh, Regency dress for Regency week last week which was, was commented on um, although you do also have to when you're in the house you do you're also on duty so it's very difficult to go and you know deal with a broken gate or something <laughs> <laughs> if you're in a full Regency outfit you do sort of need the flat shoes to be able to <laughs> <laughs> something's fallen in the ha ha or something like that it's very it all wrong you just got to faint <laughs> find a handsome bloke a full skirt and hat so yeah it's um, <laughs> but some visitors that is absolutely gorgeous uh, you just see people groups coming up the drive all in all in dress so superb. Uh, absolutely superb Oh, well, thanks ever so much, Katie. This has been really interesting. I really appreciate your time today. So thanks ever so much. So this talk's going to be available on our Facebook page later and on the website. And if you enjoyed today, then you might be interested in some of our other online events, especially the interview with Prince William and Prince Harry's uncle, Earl Spencer, which is taking place on the 22nd of September. So he's going to talk to us about his new book. So, and we're also planning a writing conference next year at Chawton, provided that we can actually physically get together. So you may be interested in keeping an eye out for that as well. So keep looking at our events list on our website and on our Facebook page. And if you join the Society as a friend, then you'll find out about events firsthand from our bulletins. So um, look at our website for details. So, and as, as Katie said, the gardens are open at Chawton House. So do go and um, visit because it really is beautiful. Anyway, goodbye, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. And look forward to seeing you all again soon. So bye, Katie. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.